Okay, I think we, we must start uh, numbers. Recording in progress. Because we still have a sitting uh, in the afternoon. Um, honorable members of the portfolio committee, acting DG and your team from the department, the minister, our new minister in absentia, the deputy minister, hoping that she will join us soon. I am Yeche. Yes? I'm Yeche. Oh, okay. Deputy Minister, and all those that are part of our meeting um, today. Uh, this is a special meeting as part, it's a normal meeting for us, but it is a special meeting because in this meeting, it is the first time that we have new members of the executive. After the pronouncement by the president in which she, he reshuffled some of the members of the executive, appointed new ministers and deputy ministers. Our, well, the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure got a new minister and a deputy minister who are part of this meeting today. We welcome them in this meeting, hoping that we will work well with them moving forward. Um, they will take where the two, that is Honorable Minister Delil and Deputy Minister Nokolo Kivit left off and they will continue. Yes, we had our hiccups, but we were working well together with them. We hope we'll do so even with the two members that have joined um, this portfolio committee. Uh, today, we are going to deal with the Nella, your agenda. We're going to deal with the action plan of the department on the audit outcomes. And then later on, we will be dealing with the APPs, but I don't know whether uh, the new minister and the deputy minister had a chance to look at this APP because the one that we have is the one that was prepared by the, the previous executive that is no longer with us in this uh, portfolio committee. Uh, the acting DG said that he will be returning the call to me. I don't know whether yesterday or the other day when I asked him whether have the minister and the deputy minister exhausted this APP. Remember, honorable members, we didn't have our meeting last week due to the fact of the change of the executive and the fact that at the time we didn't have a minister, we didn't have a, a, a deputy minister because they were still to be sworn in. So we agreed that the, the meeting should be postponed. That is why we are having this meeting today. When we tried to postpone it to Tuesday, yesterday, there was the induction of the cabinet Monday and Tuesday and as such, they could not attend the meeting. So we decided that the, the program of dealing with the, with the entities that is IDT and CIPT, we will deal that with them next week. But this week, we must continue with what we're supposed to do last week on Wednesday. So I think the, the DM will, the DG will respond to that together with the DM. But um, honorable members and all those that are watching uh, this portfolio committee, you are all welcome. And I hope that as we usually do, 
we will have the we will deliberate progressively. Um, I think um, let me allow um, uh, members from each political party uh, just two minutes, uh, honourable member, so that we don't waste time in welcoming the new minister in absentia and the deputy minister in our portfolio committee. Just two minutes only, uh, honourable members. Um, we will start with the ANC. Honorable Mjobo. Is Honorable Mjobo in? Yes, Chairperson, good morning. Yes, we are saying just uh, yes, from each political party in welcoming the new minister and the deputy minister. Oh, okay. Okay. Th thanks. Thanks, Chairperson. Good morning to members of the portfolio committee and the team and the department of public works and i would like to congratulate the minister and the deputy minister and welcome them to the to our portfolio committee uh, in those few words thanks Chairperson. thank you honorable Mjabo. Uh, the ta Um, hi, Chairperson. Yes, I'd just like to introduce myself, Samantha Graham Maria, as the Shadow Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure, and Honourable Madeleine Hicklin as the Deputy Shadow Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Graham Maria. Uh, we were just welcoming them, but it doesn't matter. Um, the EFF, Honourable Suisa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Chair, I'm going to keep my video off because of load shedding where I am. Uh, this is Honorable Matapelo Suisa representing the EFF in the Committee of Public Works and Infrastructure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Suisa. The IFP, Honorable Zondo. Is he in the meeting? He's not in the meeting, Chair. The ACTP Honorable Tring. Not in the meeting. He's not in the meeting also. Uh, the FF Plus Honorable Van Staden. Honorable Van Staden has attended an apology, Chairperson. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, other members, for introducing yourselves when I asked you to just welcome these members uh, so that they know that they will be working with us in moving forward. Um, I'll, I'm now going to invite uh, Ms. Martinez to table any apologies that you have. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and, and good morning to members and the members of the executive, as well as our colleagues. Um, the two apologies that I have, Chairperson, um, one of them is the one from the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure, who I have already alluded to the fact that he's attending a, a cabinet meeting today. The second apology is from Honorable Van Staden, who is attending the PC on Health. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Ms. Martinez. I now invite... Um the department uh, to present the action plan of the department and the PMTE. Um, I, I will invite, uh, what we usually do at the end is to invite you just to say a few words and then allow the acting DG to present. Over to you, Honorable TM. Um, good morning, Honorable Chair and um all members of the committee. Uh, thank you for welcoming myself and uh, the minister in his absentia. And um, we are looking forward to working very well with uh, the committee um, and that we will uh, be able to uh, find each other. 
uh, we are not new, but new in the uh, department, yes. And um, also, Chair, thanking you that um, you have uh, welcomed us into the committee. So with those few words, Chair, I would like to thank you for welcoming us and to uh, we will get ourselves up to speech on what needs to be done on deliverables in the departments itself. Thank you, Chair. Acting DG, over to you. I can see that your mic is on, but I can't hear anything that you're saying. Manta? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. I'm not sure if I can proceed because I'm the one who must present the audit action plan while the DG is trying to uh, I mean, talk. Maybe let me get guidance from you, Chair. Yes, you can, but uh, okay. Continue, uh, Mandla. Um, I think they've given you okay. host rights, okay. Um, DM, Honorable DM. No, thank you, Chair. Chair, the um, acting DG says he's struggling to connect, but he's trying to reconnect again. I've just asked him what is the problem. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Manta, are we waiting for you? Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me share. Um, person, uh, good morning to you and uh, honorable members, Deputy Minister and uh, colleagues. Uh, okay, we are presenting the audit action plans. Uh, what we are also providing the uh, uh, portfolio committee with is the progress that we have made. Uh, I'm not sure if my slides are moving, Chair. Um, so I'm on slide number three now. Um, I hope the members can see. So for the PMT chair, in terms of the, the summary, we received the disclaimer uh, as an um, audit opinion from Auditor General. Uh, it was mainly because of property plant and equipment, which is our immobile asset register. Uh, then there were other items that uh, AG qualified us on, which mainly were accruals different types of accruals, which was um, 
accrual for leases, uh, for municipal services, and for day-to-day -day maintenance. Then on the main vote, which is the, the department, we managed to maintain the unqualified audit opinion with findings on performance information for EPWP and uh, CPM. Uh, just to give the overall progress where we are in terms of the, 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 the progress, we've developed the audit action plans immediately after the audit report was uh, issued by Auditor General. Uh, where we are in terms of uh, those action plans. Uh, the issue on the immovable asset register was uh, the opening balance uh, that was not supported by supporting document for audit purpose. Uh, what we have done in that area, uh, we, we did submit actually on the, on, during the audit, it's just that it was too late for the audit process then uh, hence we then got a disclaimer but we have subsequently submitted that information during the interim audit which is underway by auditor general uh, ag is currently auditing that uh, uh, restated balance uh, also internal audit has uh, audited that uh, um, aud uh, restated balance so we hope then that process will uh, go smoothly uh, which will then uh, address uh, the disclaimer. Um, then on leases, um, as I said, it was part of the qualification uh, in terms of accruals where incorrect amounts were disclosed. Uh, where we are also on that, um, we have uh, completed the process that we said we would do where the data uh, cleansing was completed and we are monitoring on monthly basis. Uh, it was also included in the interim financial statements that was uh, submitted to Auditor General for audit. And the internal audit also did review that workbook. And uh, it's before the Auditor General for auditing. Uh, what is good with this one? We've asked AG to fully audit uh, leases so that it will, it will help us for year end. So that, that audit process is underway. Then the other accruals, which is mainly day-to-day -day maintenance and municipal services, uh, that, that process also, uh, we, we, we did uh, that process, which was part of the interim financial statements. However, for these types of accruals, you only see the full impact at year end. So during the year, there might be gaps because you have to provide for accruals where service has been rendered but uh, suppliers may not have uh, submitted the invoices so it's something that we have to estimate uh, uh, half yearly but uh, at year end then you have a complete uh, uh, cycle of the process and also this area of work it's before auditor general for audit during the interim uh, audit then the next slide um the next two flights, I will ask uh, Bonito Sokela to just give uh, the audit committee, uh, I mean the audit uh, portfolio committee, where we are in terms of the details for immovable asset register, because this is a significant area that caused a disclaimer. Uh, Dr. Sokela, over to you. Yes, uh, good morning, Professor. Uh, and honorable member. Well, in terms of the asset register, as the CFO has pointed out that we had, there was a limitation of scope. Of course, the root causes of that limitation of scope was the late submission uh, of information uh, by SEPs, because we normally request information from uh, client departments. So SEPs has uh, appointed implementing agents for assets under construction. Unfortunately, we received the information towards the end of May. In actual fact, it was the 26th of May. So it was actually too late for us uh, even to make adjustments or to process that information. Uh, in addition, also, we use the DITS download uh, to 
address management assertion on completeness. This is for both national and provincial custodians. Again, the base download was received very late. It was around the 10th of May because it's a long process where we have to engage uh, both internal and external stakeholders before we can finalize uh, that uh, analysis where we address also the rights and obligations because we have common historical names uh, as government. So in terms, we have the, the planned actions, I don't know, CFO and Jefferson, maybe I can just focus on the progress that we've made uh, thus far. Uh, as the CFO has pointed out, the opening uh, balance, the restatement has been audited by the internal audit. Uh, and currently, even the Office of the Auditor General is actually auditing the restatement. We have received uh, some requests for information. We are engaging them as part of the, of the interim uh, financial statements. So we believe that that issue will actually be resolved. Yes, uh, the information was submitted, although late due to the reason that I've just uh, highlighted. Uh, we have also approached the deeds office to provide the information on time, more especially the interim deeds, as well as the final deeds download. We have already, the process of analyzing the interim deeds is, is, is actually complete now. And we've engaged SERPs as well to provide information now on a quarterly basis, as opposed to the previous financial year where they submitted information very late uh, towards the end of May. We have received information for the first two quarters, the third quarter, they are finalizing it. I think there was just some issues with uh, their accruals. Uh, and then of course the additions we are, we are addressing, we've loaded the additions on the systems and uh, the filling of posts because another reason why the information was submitted late, we had some uh, vacancies, uh, uh, critical positions. We are in the process uh, of filling those positions. And then the second issue was the reassessment uh, of useful life. Again, we had uh, challenges with, with capacity because the contracts had expired. Uh, but for this year, we have actually managed to, to, to do the reassessment on 680 uh, buildings. There was also a finding uh, on rights and an obligation. Uh, pertaining to illegal transfers, we have a challenge whereby uh, this actually happens at the deeds office in some instances whereby uh, properties that are under the national government, we find that the, the ownership has actually changed from the state uh, to private. But what we normally do in those cases, we conduct uh, investigations, we ring fence those properties uh, under the program Operation Bring Back and we conduct further investigations. But apart from conducting the further investigations on the properties where ownership has changed, we have, been, we have engaged the chief register of deeds uh, to issue a secular. As they say, uh, prevention is actually better than cure. So that because deeds can prevent this, if it's a sale, because as government, we don't sell properties. The DPW, we donate land, to other custodians or municipalities or human settlement. So we, the trigger is that if it's a sale of the land, then the deeds office should contact a DPWI or other custodians just to confirm if that transaction has been approved by the minister. And then also on this issue, there was also proper, there was a finding on properties according to AG, they argued that those properties don't belong to PMTE. Uh, we have had um, a workshop, it, it was early this year, on the 18th of January with 18th, with the, with the CFO and his team, where we discussed the issue because uh, the, the issue here is the historical names because as government, our properties are actually registered in more than 3,000 names. These are historical names. Since we have vesting, we're through the process of vesting, we are eliminating all these historical names so that the properties that belong to national can be registered in the name of the national government of the Republic of South Africa. So maybe maybe due to the understanding, uh, maybe on the part of AG, the historical names like the formative DC states and the self-governing territories, for instance, one of the registered owners of those properties was Kangwani Police, which is a former 
theft of the territory. They argue that that particular property does not belong to the department. But like I said, Ella, we've had a session whereby we took AG through uh, this process just to explain the history, the background of government, all these historical names. There is an understanding and we've actually agreed that we will prepare a, a, a what you call a frequently asked questions. We will prepare frequently asked questions on state land matters, so as to help uh, AG because they are accountants. They probably do not have the institutional or, or background information uh, on state land. So on that issue, on, in terms of, of the progress, again, as I've pointed out on the, on the first slide, yes, on, on the deeds, we've made the progress, and we are also addressing the issue of illegal ownership. Uh, the DG signed the letter that we sent to the DG of uh, Rural Development uh, to just ensure that we prevent uh, further change of, of properties uh, at, the, at the deeds office. And the other issue was the impairment of state-owned uh, buildings. Uh, this one, uh, was because of the condition assessments that AG argued that uh, we did not uh, have the, the support, uh, but uh, we, we have since uh, looked at the schedules for 2023 and we've selected the samples and uh, we are in the process uh, of, of conducting the impairment together with uh, the REMS division uh, of DPWI. Let me hand over to the speaker. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Chair, I'm not sure how much we must deal with the details. I'm not sure if the APP will be discussed. If that is the case, I'll quickly summarize uh, the issues. If maybe I can just get guidance from the chair in terms of managing time. On that note, uh, we solely depend because the DG, I don't know whether he's in or maybe the deputy minister may assist us on this on this case on the issue of the APPs whether they have finally signed them off with the minister but last time I talked to the teacher that was not yet done oh, oh okay uh, I'm not sure then if I can proceed then in details I'm not sure if the DG has joined. Let me check. Oh, DG is here. DG is in the meeting. Yes, I'm here, Chair. Correspond. Uh, Chair, the matter of the APP is before the Minister. As you, the Chair may have been aware, DPME had arranged with uh, the speaker's office for the extension of time for submission. We we are hoping that our minister is able to finalize uh, on the APP on an urgent basis, and uh, then we will table it before the the house and the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I'll try to go a little bit details then, but not that too much details. Then on, on Lisi's uh, chair, which was part of uh, the qualification, um, the progress there, uh, it's going well. A uh, lot of things are completed. Uh, the one that is a little bit behind, it's a uh, validation of leases uh, on Akipas. Uh, six regions are complete. Uh, we are busy finalizing uh, five regions, which we hope before end of this month, they will all be completed. Then the locking of the system that was successfully done uh, on the 6th of so, uh, October, and uh, then obtaining of lease agreements. Uh, at a time when we prepared this presentation, we were at 99%. We, have, uh, uh, we are now at 100%. 
then verifying uh, information uh, on the system for rental debtors that it was completed for interim financial statements and the uh, AG is currently uh, auditing that. Um, moving to the next uh, category of uh, accruals, uh, I won't go into details except to say uh, also in that area, the progress is um, going fine. But this area, we have a little bit of challenges here, uh, particularly on day-to-day uh, -day maintenance. Uh, there are a lot of calls that we need to update, which uh, our ICT is helping us uh, together with FM. And uh, we hope also that will be done uh, by 31st of uh, March. But the DTGFM will come in during the questions just to further provide a, a guidance in that area. But in terms of um, the financial interim financial statements, we did submit information uh, to Auditor General, even though we know that it was not 100% uh, complete. Uh, the next set of uh, accruals uh, is the same. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on that one. I'll quickly move now to um, on slide number on performance chair. Uh, on performance information, which is slide number 14 chair, uh, HG raised the issue on CPM. Sorry, where... Chair. Honorable Primary. I'm sorry to interrupt. I really do apologize, but um, the slides are not progressing. And I don't have another device because my laptop was stolen. So I've got nothing else to, to track. So at this stage, we're on slide seven. And I think we're chatting now about slide 12. Oh, my Cynthia apology. Uh, on my side, it's moving. I'm on slide 14. I don't know how I can. Maybe let me stop hearing and reshare. I'm not sure if it will move. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure if it's showing now. I'm on slide number 14. Yes, you can see that now. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. I, if maybe I will get, uh, I can get an indication if it's not moving. Uh, thank you. I'm on slide number 14 now, um, where AG raised significant issues on performance information uh, on CPM, uh, the annual performance report materially differed from the supporting evidence that was provided for audit purpose. Uh, there were action plans that were put uh, by the relevant branch, uh, which I'm not going to read in details, uh, but I'll focus more on the progress. According to the progress, uh, uh, just a high level uh, action plans that were put in place, uh, the audit action plan was a uh, discuss with all the project managers across the regions and uh, it is monitored uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the draft final quarterly performance reports are supported by portfolio of evidence, which are submitted for internal review and uh, also internal audit uh, does uh, audit site progress report on quarterly basis. Uh, on implementing agents, the template was submitted to all implementing agents and uh, it's being checked by relevant portfolio managers and the workshop will take place in quarter four, uh, which is uh, the quarter four is towards the end now, uh, but the DTG uh, CPM is addressing that matter. Uh, then the last issue that I want to raise, uh, which is significant, is the filing and record uh, keeping. Uh, we were supposed to roll out the paper trail, uh, which it's 95% uh, done in terms of the regional offices where uh, all regions have been registered in paper trail, but uh, also the DTG will provide more details in terms of how far are we in that area in terms of the actual uh, use of paper trail. And, and the training has been provided to all officials, in particular Mabato, because that's where the limitation of scope was. Mm -hmm. Then moving to EPWP. My slide also is not moving now. 
Uh, okay, now it has moved. I'm not sure if it has moved. Chair, Chair may, I, may I ask a question? Um, are we really accomplishing what we are setting out to accomplish with this presentation in view of the fact that the department has not signed off on the APPs yet? And it just seems to be that we are going through a tick box exercise of just moving through the action plan without it having been signed off. And I don't know whether we are really accomplishing anything other than just going through the motions and whatever our discussion is going to be at the end of this is it going to be is it materially going to have any impact or are we going to have to have this discussion yet again when the minister is actually in on the meeting and we have to go through the apps in depth i'm just concerned because we are literally flying through this presentation um and i'm concerned that it's not having any real impact because i'm just picking up bits and pieces where we're not really delving into the meat of this presentation. It's just a concern on my side. Uh, thank you, um, Honorable Hicklin. Uh, I see that the DM wants to come in. Uh, Honorable DM. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, I hear what uh, uh, um, Honorable Hicklin is saying. However, the APP is in front of the minister um, and is yet to be signed off, yes. But however, I don't think that we can equally say that in totality that we are going through a future exercise because I would have thought that this presentation, as much as the APP has not yet been signed off, if and when members are going to give their inputs, uh, we will then see how we move forward rather than saying that we are going through a future exercise in totality. Because uh, I will say that uh, with confidence that um, the APP is in front of the minister and not yet signed, uh, but I will be corrected if we are then saying that what we are going through is a future exercise. Because I think that what she is raising is that uh, we are going very fast through it and all those type of things. But I think that she will be guided by you because we don't know how much work we had already put in, uh, into this itself uh, for us to have reached the stage of this presentation today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, GM. Um... Okay, I don't see any other hand from the from the members. Um, I, I think um, Honorable Hicklin, uh, I'm likely to agree with DM on on this instance that uh, the the audit action plan it has to be presented to us. In fact, if you see on the even the items um, agenda items, we have the audit action plan as the agenda item number one, and then the APP is the agenda item number two. So what we're going to do is that we're going to remove the agenda item number two, but we have to deal with the action plan. Uh, I think it, it will also assist us even in our deliberations when we deal with the APP uh, when it is presented to us, hoping that DM, um, as you are here in the meeting, you will try to at least ensure that the minister does that quickly with the agency that it deserves. So at, at least by next week, we deal with it. Uh, we are a bit late. We are really a bit, a bit, a bit late. Uh, I saw Nola when we were trying to crunch the dates, uh, she even said on the 21st, I had to remind her, that on the 21st of March, it's a public holiday. So we can't have a portfolio meeting on, on the 21st. So we are forced to that on the 22nd, 
we deal with this APP. Um, thank you. Thank you. So can I can I then uh, allow the the presenter to continue? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'm on slide number 15 now, uh, which is the performance uh, information uh, for EPWP, where AG also raised material findings. Uh, the finding that Auditor General raised for EPWP was the annual performance report, which was materially different from the supporting evidence uh, that was provided against the indicators. Uh, I'll want to spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, we then had to put action plans in response to this. Uh, the first action plan that we did was to conduct public body visits to 150 uh, public bodies with feedback report issued on findings. Uh, we had the deadlines or the targets that we set for ourselves. Uh, we said by end of November, we should have visited 50 uh, public bodies in January 100 and March 150. Where we are uh, as at end of January, 147 public bodies were uh, completed in terms of the visit. 28 of them were compliant and 119 were not compliant. And there are a lot of follow-ups that are being made with those public bodies that did not comply. And uh, to date, also, there were letters of intervention or escalation that were forwarded to accounting officers of those uh, public bodies that were not complying. Uh, we still believe that uh, we'll achieve the target by end of uh, March 2023. The other uh, planned action that we then said we will do was to validate 290 projects remotely with feedback report issued on findings. We also had uh, timelines uh, on that. Um, I will focus on the progress. 91 projects were validated as at end of November 2022. Uh, and uh, the latest progress as at uh, end of Feb 2023, 168, which is a cumulative uh, 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 progress. Uh, so 168 projects have been validated remotely. Internal resources have been allocated to the project and uh, our internal resources will be added in March to make sure that we finalize the, 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 the action that we said we'll do. And we believe also this will be completed by end of March. Uh, the other area that we had to do was to roll out uh, version two of the EPWP reporting system to municipalities. Um, the procurement process has been completed. Uh, the rollout of the version was completed for all three spheres of government, uh, which was done in January. Then the version two of the EPWP uh, reporting system has additional features for quality control. This includes the ability of public bodies to upload additional project documentation, like your attendant register and contract, which assist in quality control. So if all these things are properly done, it will begin to respond to the issues that uh, Auditor General raised. Then development of a standard operating procedure uh, on EPWP coordination by the EPWP branch was part of the uh, action plan. And the, those SOP has been drafted and will be finalized before 31st March, 2023. I must mention here, all what we are trying to do is to standardize for all public bodies, but there are processes that uh, are there. It's just it's a matter of now standardizing. It's not to say for the whole year, nothing has been done to the extent that maybe some members may ask, what is the relevant of finishing this, this exercise at the end of the financial year? So I thought, let me also uh, deal with that. Um, then the next slide, uh, I'm sorry, my slides are moving slow on my side. Um, okay, then uh, EPWP reporting system challenges, uh, exception which might compromise the integrity of work opportunities where disease beneficiaries were identified as uh, exceptions, invalid ID, and employees on PESAL. 
Uh, these are the issues that AG raised. We had a planned action, which was to validate reported data against the National Population Register of the Department of Home Affairs. Where we are with that, uh, ID numbers of reported participants are routinely verified against the NPR system. The process is automated. So that's a, a comfort that we have now. Then validate reported data against the personal data, which is also quarterly. Uh, ver verification of participants' ID numbers against the PESAL is performed quarterly. The process is manual, unfortunately. Uh, there is an exchange of data between DPSA and DPW, which is done through the paper trade system. And uh, we hope this also will uh, address uh, fully the audit risk that was identified. So, um, there were other several findings uh, or matters or observation relating to performance data and upskilling, training and certification of participants, which AG raised. And there were planned actions, which are similar to development of a, a SOP, like I've already explained. So I'm not going to repeat that. I think the both um, action plans are in line with the previous uh, action plans that I've already indicated. The, the next slide uh, person will be focusing on the BRR report, which was presented to the portfolio committee by the audit com uh, by auditor general. Um, there was an issue which AG raised, uh, which was poor condition uh, of our properties, which are still in use. Um, they, they, I, we identified number of root causes in that area where in particular just to raise uh, some of the root causes, poor security of, uh, of the buildings by user departments, lack of adequate plant maintenance, theft by appointed service providers, lack of proper care and maintenance within the user's delegations. So the plans that we had to put in place, we then felt that we need to do annual inspection of 100 properties. Uh, members will recall that that report was given uh, to the department around November by Auditor General. So given the time, we had to only deal with 100 properties. Then the other uh, action plan that we had to put in place was to communicate findings to value chain branches after that inspection, then also to hold users accountable for their failure to look after, uh, uh, after our properties. Where we are, uh, we have scheduled to complete the total of 100 properties for all 11 regions by end of March, uh, 100 properties based on the remaining period of the financial year, as I've already explained. Inspection have already commenced with scheduled reporting date uh, between the 11th and the 21st uh, of March, uh, of after which a full report will be provided and it will be distributed to relevant branches uh, within the department to develop and implement maintenance plan. Uh, user departments also will be held accountable where they are found wanting in terms of uh, uh, looking after our properties. Uh, then unutilized properties, which was the another issue that AG raised. Uh, we also had to put action plans on that. One of the action plan is to let out unutilized state-owned properties to interested investors through long-term leases. Where we are on that, the procurement process on letting out of state-owned properties has been approved by the, our committees concurrent on the actual properties to be let out currently sought from the accounting officer. The, the advertisement of the bid to be published uh, on the beginning of April 2023. Then also to report unsafeguarded properties to security services, and that is ongoing as uh, we become aware of such and also reporting on, on criminal activities that is also uh, ongoing. Um, then the other one was the market analysis where rental rates uh, were not aligned to the market. Uh, we have enforced uh, uh, such in instances where landlords are refusing. So at this stage, there are no problems because uh, all our leases are now in line with draw the report, but where then there are issues such they are escalated to national negotiating committee 
uh, where then the intervention is done at an appropriate time. I must indicate, uh, Chairperson, as a result of this intervention, uh, a lot of savings has been realized uh, as a result of uh, this process where the department begin to uh, save on leases. The next slide was uh, which AG also raised was vandalized state uh, owned properties. Uh, the action plans that we had to put in place for that, we had to identify properties that can be placed under the repair, operate, and transfer program, which we normally call as ROTP. Where we are on that one, uh, we have identified five, five properties, uh, which will then go through that uh, program. Uh, those properties that were identified, it's Civitas, Telecom Towers, Public Works House, and SAPS Police Station, and Barracks Central, um, and other flats for DOD. So the target for that um, is to finalize those uh, properties uh, as soon as possible. I know there is a process that is underway to deal with that. However, we'll go uh, um, uh, in a in an aggressive way in the new financial year, where then our target is 50 properties, where we are talking of big properties here that can accommodate a head office of departments like your public workhouse. It's a very big property. So that's our target to target those big properties, which will even assist us to reduce reliance on private sector. Then the other thing that is the same as the other uh, uh, planned action was to report uh, where there are criminal activities is same as what I've already indicated. Then the the month to month leases, which was an issue for Auditor General, um, we have put action plans, which I will also provide progress for each uh, action plan. We had to amend service level agreement where clients departments must uh, give us a mandate within 24 months before the lease can expire. So that SLA has been amended. We are in a process of uh, engaging departments because they need to sign that SLA. Once it's done, we'll then uh, implement it. And um, there are also interventions that we are making uh, where clients are not giving us mandate. Uh, I must indicate interventions have also yielded to a uh, good result uh, where all new leases are below market. Then uh, use of road, it's, that one has been implemented and it's ongoing. Um, and then the other matter that is important was to present cases to legal services as uh, cases become uh, relevant. Uh, as such, that is an ongoing process. We have uh, cases that uh, legal has addressed, uh, uh, like with AXA and PRASA, uh, our legal has assisted us on that. The next slide is improvement, improved asset management, um, which uh, AG also raised. We then have, uh, de we have developed a special dispensation for determination of rates uh, and leases for NCAR or and strategic tenants. This must include contribution and economic development and priorities at various stakeholders within and around the harbors. Where we are on that, uh, the CICULA has been concluded, which is CICULA 135, uh, which will then begin to assist us in addressing uh, uh, the improved asset management. Furthermore, the department through the small harbors has ensured that harbors are at an operational level insofar as infrastructure and maintenance so that the rates and lease arrangements are concluded by, by the leasing. The recent upgrades will increase investor confidence as, as well as to ensure that all leases, including harbor leases, are renewed with, with all tenants. Uh, we had also to address security issues where then the department uh, will then assist the Department of Forest, Fisheries and Environment, Environment on the user asset management plan for security needs that should, should address all security risk, uh, risk, including joint responsibilities. We had meetings uh, with, with DFFE, which resolved to procure security services and uh, service providers have been appointed. Backend facilities which needed security are currently safeguarded based on the risk assessment that was conducted. 
And then the other issue that we had to deal with was implementation of value chain asset management in the harbors. Uh, there is updated UMs were received from PFFE for implementation in 23-24 financial year. And the last action was to include harbors in the pilot phase of social facilitation. DFFE together with DPW under Operation Pakisa has appointed the IDT to conduct social facilitation for all, for all the harbor project and is implementing this through the EPWP. The next slide here is slide number 21. Um, where AG then uh, raised the issues around uh, us spending more than what has been budgeted for the project. What we have done there, we, we have put action plans uh, where we want to cap exorbitant construction costs by engaging with uh, AECOM and uh, institutionalizing the Africa Property and Construction Cost Guide as a benchmark of construction cost per square meter for public works and infrastructure project. Where we are with that, uh, Legal Services uh, is engage has engaged all the stakeholders and we anticipate that there will be a Gazette uh, on or by the 31st of March 2023, which will then see implementation from, from 1st of April. Uh, various training sessions were also held, held on WCS training uh, sessions. Uh, JVCC 2018 contract data and GCS 2015. So there are a lot of training that are happening with our project managers to make sure that uh, we address all the risk areas. Uh, the next slide here was the significant, is significant delayed project, which AG also raised as a, an audit finding. We also have a number of uh, planned audit action plans uh, that uh, intended to uh, respond to that. I'm not going to read them. There are quite a lot. I'll focus more on the progress where we are in terms of those uh, planned actions. The first one uh, is for is for us to have uh, to draft the, the delegation, which has been done. Uh, however, the approval process will happen in the first quarter because we had to do a lot of checks and balances. So we'll begin to see the impact of that delegation in the new financial year. The task team uh, to be established in quarter one to review the risk assessment and also to submit to the forms committee uh, for approval. There is also an ongoing issues where the circular was issued to all heads of project uh, to make sure that uh, the issue of defaulting contractors is prevented uh, as much as we can while we know that it's within the industry that some contractors will default uh, because of how they manage their project. And some of them, uh, it's because of economic conditions, hence they also uh, default. Um, we also uh, have uh, the contract documentation for consultants, uh, where then we updated uh, the issue of the penalty so that mm -hmm. where then uh, contractors are not properly managed, we can also hold consultants accountable. Um, the other issue is uh, the consequence management, which is ongoing. Uh, letters were issued to officials uh, to explain why certain things were not done properly. Uh, and that process has been referred to um, labor relations for further action. Uh, and members, thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation for uh, audit action plans. Thank you, Chair. Uh, acting DG, any additions? Acting DG? Okay, in the absence of the acting DG responding, uh, honorable members, this is the audit action plan um, uh, that the department is presenting to us. Um, can we then uh, engage on it? Um, honorable Siwisa, you will be number one. 
Honorable Graham Mare, number two. Honorable Hicklin, number three. Uh, I know there are many members that are saying that they are struggling with, with network. If, if you can raise your hand, you can just indicate um, saying uh, maybe your name so that I understand that you will also be speaking. But let's start with the three members that they have raised their hands. Honorable Siwisa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity again. Chair, I've been listening to the presentation that's been done. These are the things that I've picked up. Breakdown in communication between subs and DPWI. This is pertaining to late submissions of things to the department by subs. It shows that there is no urgency. It shows that there is no, there's a lot of incompetence. My second point would be how does state property end up in private ownership? It means that there is no clear monitoring that is happening. And I think I've stated it in the past to say, when we are told that the reports are being sent by regional officers, I asked specifically, are we talking about oversight where we get reports where boxes are ticked that the following things have been done? Are we talking about reports that are being received in air conditioned offices? Or are we talking about actually going on site and see what's happening? A few weeks back, we, we were here and we heard one of my colleagues, uh, Honorable Tapelo, stated that there are houses in Swan region that that is a little bit that those how there are houses that are being occupied and those are state houses so it 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 raises a very serious concern to me and when we come to when they speak about state property that end up in private and recently the national assembly has adopted the expropriation bill and as an EFF, as we have stated that we don't support that expropriation bill, we are saying that all state must belong, must the, the state must be the custodian of all property within the boundaries of South Africa. Now we've got properties that end up in private ownership. We don't know how it ended up in private ownership. And then there is the expropriation bill that says that we must take into consideration the history of how the property was acquired. Is this bill even going to serve its, 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 its purpose, taking into consideration that now we are being told that there is state property that has ended up in private property and they don't know how. So is the bill even going to serve its, 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 its purpose? Unless we say that everything must come back, nobody must be paid anything, that's one. That's another point. Uh, according to the report, um, 300 uh, uh, state, uh, uh, state properties were visited, according to the report. And yet we are told about 147. And out of the 147, 119 are non-compliant or public bodies are non-compliant. So what happened between 147 and 300? Because if you take the numbers, it's 50, 100, and 150, it gives you 300. But we are only told about 147, and then 119 out of the 147 are non-compliant. Uh, how many in November, how many in January, how many in March? Because now eight letters were issued. And yet we speak about 119 non-compliant bodies and only eight letters were issued to uh, accounting officers. So again, we get back to lease out of private, uh, of, of state property to private ownership. Again, a few weeks back, I asked a question to say that then Minister of Public Works, Patricia Dalil said, She's thinking about consulting or approaching the cabinet to say that the buildings that they cannot maintain or is too expensive to maintain, they think about selling them. 
And today we are being told that buildings are going to be leased out to private ownership, which is very contradicting. Which is which? Are you leasing out the buildings or are you going to sell those buildings to private ownership? And it doesn't make sense to me that we are taking state buildings, giving them to private ownership. And then we go back to the same people to go and rent the same buildings that we've sold to them. And then we are speaking about the expropriation bill to say that those buildings must come back. And then we are going to pay back those people the money that they bought the buildings that belong to the state. So it's, it's very contradicting to me. Another thing I want to ask about the maintenance plan. We were told that there is a maintenance plan in place in one of the meetings. And yet sister departments are vacating buildings because of the, 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 the poor condition of, of those buildings. So what happened to the maintenance plans? Handing over of, of property to contractors has a negative effect, effect on the society. What are the intervention strategies that the department is going to do pertaining to that? But in a nutshell, uh, uh, when a chairperson, um, I don't think the department knows what they are supposed to be doing, honestly speaking, especially when it comes to property and making sure that sister departments and any other person or any other, all the sister departments and public bodies, they need to have property where they can execute their job. I don't think the department has grasped as to what is their role in ensuring that South Africa is actually moving forward and be effective and allowing departments to do their work. They are very far from that. Leasing out and renting and selling and, list, you know, it's, it's just a mess. I don't think that the department still knows what, what is their role. Maybe they need to go back and understand their own mission and vision as to what are they supposed to give the South Africans. Thank you, Jen. Honorable Graham Mare. Yeah, the next. Thank you, Honorable Suiza. Sorry, Chair, I'm using a different device. So I apologize that I don't have um, good, uh, the proper background. Um, my laptop was stolen last week out of my car. So um, I'm just trying to get my life sorted out working off a tablet. So please forgive me for the background. Um, Chairperson, thank you for, the, for this. Um, look, it's a bit frustrating, you know, we, we've postponed meetings because the minister couldn't attend and then the minister didn't attend anyway, so um, so that's already a, a bit of a red flag, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, this morning's meeting was an absolute disaster and so unprofessional and that's not how our committee operates, so um, I don't know what's going on in the department, they seem to be sort of at um, sixes and sevens, but hopefully... Hopefully they will um, find their stride with the new minister and the new deputy minister. Um, with respect to the audit action plan, um, again, these plans are great, but they must be implemented. And there seems to have been um, a lot of areas in which they have um, met their requirements. Um, also, we haven't had um, the presentation from the AG that was also postponed. So we are only getting in one side of the story, um, which makes it a bit difficult to evaluate um, the efficacy of the um, compliance of the audit action plan versus what, what the AG required. Um, in terms of slide six um, on the illegal transfers, um, the first thing I wanted to know was DPWI doesn't sell properties, they donate them. So I found that was very interesting. I did not realize that that was a policy. Um, and I just wanted to know if this applies to entities as well. Um, or if it is just a policy of DPWI and the PMTE. So, for example, IDT are looking at selling their building. Um, is that the case? Um, and are they allowed to do that? And then, um, again, with the illegal transfers and the, and the deeds office, I recently put in a question to the minister about a property in Alphen Park um, in Ekurileni and asked um, details about this property and the, the letter that came back or the answer that came back to the question from the minister was that this property did not belong to DPWI. 
But a deeds transfer search of the property had indicated that it does belong to DPWI. So we've got a disparity here between what the deeds office says in terms of properties owned and what the DPWI says in terms of what they have on their books. So I have I have forwarded that on to um, the relevant department and just requested that they look into that mm -hmm. because there's issues with the property and nobody knows who owns it and how they can resolve the issues. Um, obviously, the day-to-day -day maintenance is a massive issue um, and that has got to be dealt with. Um, and I don't know how they're going to do that because if there's non-adherence to the CMs, and I think I've said this in the past, when a lease agreement is um, signed between the department and a user or a client, there has to be a commitment that a percentage of budget will be allocated for the day-to-day -day maintenance. Because what happens is, is that these user departments and, and client departments stay in the buildings. They do not do the day-to-day -day repairs. So these then get worse and worse and worse until it becomes a repair and refurbishment project. And then there's no budget for that because the DPWI hasn't budgeted for it. Um, and I will raise that shortly on um, properties that I did oversight on on Monday. Um, in terms of the EPWP um, on slide 15, we missed a whole lot of those slides when they weren't moving. So um, I can't speak to those because I didn't have a proper look at them. But in terms of the EPWP, there were 119 non-compliant public bodies. I just wanted to check those non those those public bodies are municipalities and um, provincial departments, I would imagine, and um, national departments. Um, have we come up yet with a strategy um, to enforce compliance? Um, and, and if so, um, is that working? Um, and is it being properly applied? Um, or will it only be applied once the EPWP policy has been implemented? So I just want clarity on that. Slide 16, um, they spoke about Purcell. Um, so what often happens is that, that people become employed for a short period through a government of, uh, um, with the Department of Education. Somebody at the Department of Education does not take them off the personal system. And then they apply for something like EPWP or CWP post, and they can't get it because they're still registered um, on personal. So in effect, potentially a manual linking of, of departments might actually function better to address that sort of issue. Um, but it is important that we build in a safeguard where we can make sure that that the people who are registered on personal, that the department that's checking that can then make sure that they say haven't worked for the last six months or whatever, and then query whether or not they're still um, employed in that in that capacity. Um, because it's, I've, I've had it with people who left the, the military and then couldn't apply for another job because they hadn't been taken off the personal system. So. Um, maybe they just need to, to look into that. Um, slide 18, the state of properties, utilized properties, doing an inspection. I don't know how this is going to be addressed going forward. On Monday, I was in Durban. I went to Periwinkle Gardens, and um, those in the department will know that we have been raising the issue around Periwinkle Gardens since December 2021. Um, so I went and did a site inspection. You cannot believe the state of this accommodation. It is a military housing estate. It should be meticulous. There are literally gardens growing out of gutters. Now, the clearing of gutters surely is a day-to-day -day maintenance thing. But again, the Department of Defense aren't entirely sure what they're supposed to do from a day-to-day -day perspective, so they just don't do anything. While we were there, there were two officers who were going around checking account numbers for um, the various residents because they're preparing for the devolution of, of their sort of work um, to, to the department. But it's just unacceptable. The grass doesn't get mowed. The fences are falling down. The wall is collapsing into the neighbor's yard. Um, the fire equipment hasn't been inspected. I couldn't even find an inspection certificate, the fire hoses. The doors are rusted, windows are broken. Um, and these are things that, that do not have to exist if there's proper care and maintenance being done. So the department, they also have to do an audit. Apparently there are people running businesses out of those houses. Um, there are um, people who are non-military who are staying in those accommodations because people sublet. Um, so there has to be some level of control that starts to be exercised over these properties. I mean, this is in a, in a residential area. 
it has become a slum. It is um, detracting from the value of all the properties in the area. Um, Acting DG, I will be submitting a full report as soon as I can get um, access to a computer. But it really is appalling and needs to be addressed. The same with the sets at Brighton, um, Brighton Beach. <clears throat> The building is collapsing. There is rebar showing through half the building um, that is rusting. There is a geyser that's leaking from the third floor. It runs all the way down um, to the ground floor um, in, the, in the married quarters. Um, and there's a lot that SAPs are not doing to take care of it. I mean, this, this police station has got no fence. They've put in four Jojo tanks with pumps. The pumps are standing attached to the Jojo tanks with the cable and the plug waiting to be plugged in somewhere. But there's been no, there's been nothing done in terms of actually attaching the pumps to any electrical outlet. There's no fence. Two weeks ago, a stolen vehicle was stolen out of the premises of the police station because they can't have any security because it's not fenced. So there is a huge amount. Our buildings are literally falling into disrepair around us. They are collapsing. The environment in which people are working is abysmal. Something has to be done to address this. These are assets of the state. They are being devalued by the day because of a complete lack of maintenance, a complete lack of a strategy in terms of repair and refurbishment. And I don't know how the department is going to address this, but this is something that has to start being prioritized. Your job as a department is to look after the state-owned properties, and it's just not happening. So this is a massive issue. In terms of Utilized buildings, Waterloo Green in Weinberg. There are three houses there. They are empty. They've been invaded by litter pickers and hobos. There have been fires in those houses. There have been people murdered in those houses. Again, it's impacting on the neighborhood. There are around two schools there. The kids now have to be escorted out of the school with security because they keep getting mugged. This is a government property. It is not being sorted. Now, I've received, I've been fighting on this for two years. We've finally been told they're going to demolish. We don't have timelines. We don't understand what they're going to do with it. They've been approached to give the property to the school. They were told. So here, here's my question again. The school approached them and asked if they could buy the property. The offer made by the school was under market value. So I don't understand how the department is saying they don't sell properties, they donate them. This would be to a school. It's a government school. It's not a private school. Why would they then say, no, we're not selling it because it's less than what we would, we would get on the market? And yet, the more that property is left, the less value that property will attract because it is just becoming an absolute slum. Um, that's housing criminals and drug addicts and all sorts of people. The castle. It is a premier tourism site in the Western Cape, in Cape Town. If anybody from the Department of Public Works has been into the city of Cape Town and seen what is going on outside the castle, you would be horrified. There is an entire settlement of homeless people living in tents and structures that they have constructed. They are urinating and defecating on the pavement in front of vehicles. They are stumbling around. There's no hygiene. There's no water. There's no control. The city of Cape Town are incapable of addressing it because the property belongs to Public Works. And Public Works has done nothing to get these people off, these prop off this property. It is absolutely shocking that, that, and I mean, again, this has been reported. I have reported this and yet nothing has happened. I drove past it yesterday. It is shocking to see what is happening. And this is a tourism site and a heritage site in, in, in the city of Cape Town. Um, and then in terms of vandalized properties, and the big office accommodation, again, the ROTP program is, is, sounds great, um, but um, we would need to, to hear more on that. And obviously, um, you know, um, Telcom Towers is a, is a big thing. But I just, I just feel that, that the, property, the property side of this department has got to be massively capacitated. They have to come up with a better strategy because what's happening now is not working. And we are slowly but surely destroying every property that is owned. I mean, the Union Buildings is an example. That place is falling to pieces. Parliament, even Parliament, the state of Parliament is not what it was when we started in Parliament five, four years ago. Um, I go on the precinct, it's dirty. There are weeds growing through the, through the, the cobblestones. Um, there's just this complete lack of interest 
in preserving what we have and something needs to be done to address this. I thank you for the opportunity, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Graham Mare. Um, Honorable Hicklin. Thank you so much, Chair, um, and welcome to the new Deputy Minister. Um, our Honourable Graham Maria and I are going to sound like the same broken record, but before I get onto the properties, I just want to make one statement about late documentation or incorrect amounts, but particularly late documentation on the immovable asset register and the challenges of the immovable asset register. What happens with, in, with documentation or information that has to come about for the immovable asset register and ensuring that information is correct for the immovable asset register? Guys, this doesn't happen as an emergency. You have an entire year before which you are going to be audited. Do your preparations. Get whatever needs to be got into place, in place, or prepare for it in time. We cannot accept that people are going to submit information late. It's not something that has Well, we lost you, Honorable Hicklin. I think it's the issue of the network. Honorable Hicklin, we have lost you. Honorable Hicklin. I think. Uh, Once in a lifetime. Honorable Hicklin. Honorable Hicklin, you can also switch off your video. I think let's give it to Honorable Mashale. We will allow Honorable Hicklin to come back later. Honorable Mashale. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to yourself. Uh, the DM and uh, the entire department, my colleagues, officials of the department, including the support staff of our portfolio committee. So, without the reputation, probably let me ask one question. The, the department have got a lot of properties and land parcels throughout the country, dilapidated. Some of these properties have become a drug stand. What is the plan of the department in relation to, to, to this department? I know Honorable Suisa asked this question, but I'm just bringing it in, in, in another format so that probably we'll know the plan of the department in relation to these buildings. What is it that you want to do with them? What is their plan? Lastly, Chair, usually the department have got proper plans in papers. But I'm afraid that uh, as far as, as implementation is concerned, they're caught uh, with their pens down. What is it that they, they are going to do this time around differently such that uh, they improve uh, service delivery? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mashale. Honorable Hicklin, are you back? I am, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, for I, one I, of I the think, reasons. I, I, yeah. Uh, me out. I think you must also switch off your video so that you try to enhance your, your network. Yes. It's done, Chair. Over Thank to you. you so much. Over to you. Over to you. Thank you so much. 
I want to go back and just reiterate what Honorable um, Graham Marais was saying about the buildings. I am going back to Gauteng on Friday to do some more oversight. I have been trying to get um, some answers on exactly what Honorable Graham Marais raised about the union buildings. The union buildings are an absolute eyesore. The palisade fencing on Zierfuchel Street lies in the street. You cannot get up to the union buildings. It's a major tourist attraction. It's also a national key point. And yet the fences are broken. The um, beautiful stone pillars that should be holding the fences are broken. The veterinary laboratories that were there are, have been dismantled. You have hobos wandering around the gardens. We don't seem as a department to actually take pride in upholding these national key points, these phenomenal buildings that everybody has so much pride in. The Department of Public Works and Infrastructure doesn't seem to have pride in these buildings anymore. The old synagogue in Swanee that was the site of the Ravonia treason trial, where Nelson Mandela and the rest of the, the people who were convicted of treason, including uh, some of the, the, the people for whom so many of us fought, is in ruins. It's in tatters. We, I was promised in answers to questions that I posed that this building would be refurbished, that it would become a home for the Department of Sports, Sports Arts and Culture, and it would also be a center or a conference center and a heritage market, market center where the heritage of the Jewish community and the heritage of South Africa could be showcased in Tswani. This was supposed to have started in 2019. We are now 2023 and nothing has happened. I am going back. Armed guards are supposed to be guarding this property. When I was there two years ago, I just walked straight in. The building is being dismantled brick by brick piece of floorboard by piece of floorboard. It's an absolute crying shame. It's a dismantling of our heritage by the very department that should be looking after this department. It's a South African heritage building. It's a Department of Public Works building and we are doing nothing to protect it. I'm going back on Friday to actually look at the further degradation. There are other houses in Malherba Street in Swanee that are absolutely derelict. Have a look at Tabachwane in Tswane, that again, much like Honorable Graham Murray was talking about, uh, Department of, De of Defense, Department of Public Works. There are four sets of flats where lifts have been welded shut and have iron gates in front of them. People who live on the top floor of the building have to drag their dustbins down three flights of stairs. You have uh, water hoses for uh, fire extinguishers that are perpetually pouring water out. There is absolutely no maintenance. The road going to the buildings, absolute crevices from no attention. Department of Public Works buildings going to rack and ruin. People have to live in these flats. Children have to play there. It's unsafe. I wouldn't like to live there. I wouldn't like my family to live there. They are members of society who protect South Africans. They are members of the military and yet the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure is derelict in its duty and is farming the, in, the maintenance and infrastructure maintenance and accountability over to the Department of Defense. It has to be a joint venture. It has to be that we care about the citizens of South Africa and can't just pass it on to another department. 
and yet we aren't. The small harbors upgrades and leases, how many, how long have we been talking about that? I know Honorable Graham Marais has been very vocal in her defense of the small harbors. We are looking at tenants in the small harbors in Cape Town who are crying out because they have a sick bay where patients who need to go to the sick bay are being charged an entrance fee, 80 year old people, or they have to walk kilometers in order to get into a sick bay because whoever is manning the gate of the entrance to that small harbor is insisting that they pay to get into the, to their own clinic. This is a Department of Public Works issue and yet we are derelict in our duty. We have to do more, we have to pull up our socks and we have to show South Africans that the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure actually cares about the citizens. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hicklin. Um, I saw the hand of Honorable Matebula, uh, but knowing that uh, his network is not so good, maybe he has been kicked out. Then uh, Honorable- I'm back, I'm back here, uh, Chair. Okay, after Honorable Matebula, Honorable Falskalvi. Yeah, no, uh, thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me uh, the opportunity to speak. Of course, we are um, struggling with a uh, network. I don't know if you can hear me, Chair. Uh, yeah, Chair. Yeah, 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 you are audible. Yeah, well, I'm with the committee uh, the in the department. Chair, I just want to, I don't know if. Matebula, can you stand in one place? We are losing you. We can hear you, lose you. Honorable Van Skalvey. Honorable Van Skalvey, over to you. Yes, Chairperson. Good morning to Honorable Chairperson. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mute my video now. I just wanted to greet on video. Yes, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good morning to Honorable Chairperson. Our uh, DM, very uh, welcome, uh, G DM, as well as the members and the uh, staff and the departmental officials. I would like to welcome the presentation that has been presented to us. And although I have many uh, concerns that I share with the previous speakers, I'm not going to venture it. I'm just going to lift a few of, 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 of the issues uh, to, to, to limit time. Chairperson, I, I, I have, a, I, I'm, I'm very worried when, when I see that time and again, every year we've been presented with the audit action plans we've be, been presented by the annual reports the 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 the, the uh, uh, strategic plans and everything and we make proposals and we we try to give direction and inputs but it seems as if uh, it's it's not being implemented or the department is very slow in implementing our proposals that we are presenting. Instead, the situation is regressing. And I share really the, the complaints uh, by the previous members in terms of the state of affairs that's just deteriorating, especially in, in, with regards to government buildings not being properly maintained and it's just a sorry state of affairs. So I'm not going to venture and name individual uh, areas of concern, but it's it's all over the same thing, and 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 we need really we need this time around. It's our last year, and it it feels as if we didn't make any impact because since 2019, it's the same things that uh, that we've been raising, and 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 it's 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 just not adhered to. When, when we look at the recommendations that we've presented. 
Chairperson, I have a challenge in terms of the internal audit that the department is having. My assumption is that the internal audit would uh, must be in a position to, to, to check what is needed, what is expected uh, before the audit is done and play an, an proactive, uh, a proactive role rather than a reactive role. But what we are seeing in the department is the internal audit comes to play after the, the audit has been done. And then they are trying to remedy the situation. And that's what, what, what leads to the department uh, faltering on, 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 on not being, not adhering to many issues that that's uh, requested during the audit. Like for instance, they, the internal audit know very well what is expected in terms of the audit needs. Therefore, they need to make sure that information, the relevant information is need, uh, which is needed is requested and gathered in time for audits to be conducted. And then chairperson, when you look at consequence management uh, in terms of various are areas, we see that there are non-compliance uh, and it's, it's just not instituted like in terms of the accrued expenses, whereas the planned actions indicated clearly consequence management to be instituted. So my concern is why is it not being done? What is hampering this area uh, uh, not being done? Then I want to request chairperson, the, the department to give us some insight in terms of the workplace skills plans, because if if they have their workplace skills plans in 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 place, they would clearly identify the skills needs and then work on it and institute the relevant uh, uh, skills uh, plans to 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 make sure that where these needs that has been identified, it's been 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 uh, addressed throughout the year so that the audit outcomes looks better, but instead some areas are, are regressing. When we, we, we see like uh, in, 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 in uh, the reassessment of useful lives uh, and, and residual values of immovable as it's not conducted, we see that uh, they, they are indicating the root causes as part, uh, as, as capacity constraints. Can, can we get an indication of which capacity are they, 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 they uh, referring to? Are we talking about human capacity, financial capacity, or what is, 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 is this capacity constraints? Because we see that it's really impacting on service delivery or the performance of, of the department. But then I want to link this issue, issue chairperson, with the, 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 the uh, 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 the fact that we see that there's a lot of money that's been uh, 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 sent back each year uh, under expenditure in terms of compensation of employees in terms of different programs, which uh, is an area of concern to me and various other members. Whilst we are in this current conjuncture of, of, a, of an economic climate, high unemployment, we see there's so much unemployment, but yet we are uh, the departments are sending money back due to compensation of employees net not 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 fault, and 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 that's an area of concern. So if we have identified these capacity constraints, why are we not uh, uh, complying in terms of this issue and uh, hiring people and ensuring that we have full-time employment. So what is the problem? Is there a, a, a challenge of not finding suitable candidates? Is there a problem of, of, of not, not finding people who, who, who apply for these positions? Or is it there just negligence in terms of, of, of uh, 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 trying to recruit these individuals. And if there's a problem of suitably uh, uh, qualified people uh, not, not being attracted, then maybe the department should look at the upward mobility uh, 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 of, of, of the current employees to, to send those employees who's, had, who's in the department to reskill them so that they can be able 
to, to, to be capacitated to fill those positions because they are already there and, and, and that's going to, to have a be better impact in terms of service delivery. I think I'll pause there. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable. Honorable Matebula, are you back? Honorable Matebula? Okay, can you then try again? Uh, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can hear you. Can you? Yeah, let me let me try, Chair. Yeah. Chair, so, well, my matter that I was actually raising, it was in relation to the issue of uh, the, the property that belong, belongs to the state, which uh, ends up in the hands of uh, public uh, individuals, I mean, pri private individuals. Uh, and the department says that uh, they do not know how, uh, you know, that property ended uh, up in those hands. It's very unfortunate because they are just telling us about that. They are not coming up with something as to how are they going to remedy that particular situation. Because if, uh, for instance, a property is landed in the hands of a private individual which belongs to the state, then it means that there was an act of criminality for it to happen in that way, unless otherwise it by it was by a, a mistake that needs to be explained. But for from where I'm actually standing, there's no a mistake that I can actually think of. I can only think of a, 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 a an act of criminality of which the department needs to investigate and come to the bottom of what happened, how did it happen? And I, I don't want to believe, Chair, that, uh, you know, because you had one political party that has been, you know, mobilizing people to occupy a vacant land and properties that is as a result of such uh, incitement. So if it is that, if that is the case, I think that we must as well, uh, you know, deal with those individuals, in particular those who are breaking the law. And the, the department must assist us in ensuring that the the private property that is in the the the, the property that is in the hands of the pri private individuals, it must be uh, reinstalled back to 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 the state. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Matebula. Uh, before I hand over to you, um, Acting DG and your team, just few comments from me. Um, the 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 first one, um, I think it's it's really a shame that uh, the PMTE has regressed in terms of its audit outcomes from a qualified, which is also not good to a disclaimer. I, I, I think I think disclaimer is it's so bad. It's 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 very, very bad. And and when um I don't know whether it was Mr. Stolle when he was explaining some of the issues that have led to this, it's issues that as the portfolio committee we have raised them time and again. The issue of 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 the immovable asset register the issue of the um, the the issue of of the the, the monthly uh, uh, leases i think we even said Auditor general has raised this several times that in fact any investigations needs to be done because it is raising red flags this issue of month to month leases and we were informed that that is being done. They have been reduced from this number. And now we're told, we are told there is a reconciliation. What is reconciliation? I think as the portfolio committee, we stated that clearly. You need to stop with month to month leases. It, it must be, if it is a short term, at least two years, but it cannot be month to month. And, and you know, we have raised this several times quoting examples. Uh, this one is scary when you are saying that there are properties of the department that have been taken by private owners. Uh, having raised with you 
that there are properties that are lying there. Honorable Marshall has even indicated that some of them, they are, they are dense for e -e 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 criminal activities. Some of them, they are used by drug lords. Uh, I even made an example where I am coming from, from the local municipality, when I reported of the, the, the residential area where they used to accommodate the magistrate, the prosecutor and all that, that building was still fine. Now there is no fencing, there is no roof in 2020. In fact, in 2022, there was no roof. In 2019, that building was fine. It had doors, it had everything. And I even said, why don't you donate these buildings to local municipalities? Some of the small municipalities, they even lack offices. So if you hand them uh, those buildings to them, they can be utilized optimally, but nothing was done. That building now, I think they are, they are true with the roofing. There are no windows, there are no doors, there is no fencing. I think now it's going to be as Honorable Hickling has indicated, they are going to take the bricks now, one by one. So there is so many of your assets and properties out there. I think you need to do a proper asset management, um, um, DG and your team, especially in these properties. And these properties that we're referring to are not properties that are owned by the provincial public works. It's the properties that are owned by the National Department of Public Works. We don't condone the fact that people are occupying those, those buildings, they are taking them, but you need to do something. So that those that are not yet taken, at least you know something about them. Uh, as, as the department has maintained an unqualified audit, the fact that the issue of EPWP is coming again, having also, as the portfolio committee raised this issue, I think it means there's something that you are not doing well there. The fact that it is an issue as much as the, the department has received an unqualified audit opinion, but it is coming in. It means there's something that you need to do there. Lastly, uh, the issue of vacancies, the issue of vacancies. We can't be told about vacancies in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, it's 2023 now. We appreciated the fact that there are new DTGs that have been employed and we have been pushing that, please fill those vacancies. There are so many people in South Africa that are not employed and you have a department that is sitting with so many posts not employing people that are qualifying out there. Please fill those posts, um, uh, please, please, please. Thank you. Over to you, um, uh, DM uh, and, and, and your team, Acting DJ, and your team. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, Chair, I, we might have just come to the department, but I think that uh, coming from the other side where I was in SCOPA, as a SCOPA member, I relatively have an idea of the frustration of the committee uh, in your oversight work and what has been presented this morning to you as the committee. I think we have lost you, DM, or is it only me, honorable members? No, we lost her, Chair. We yeah, lost yeah. her. DM, we have lost you. Um, DJ, can you come in? Uh, we will we'll try to indicate to DM to come maybe later on.
Thank you very DJ? much. Uh, yeah, thank you yes. very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, the comments of members have indeed been noted. And uh, these are not uh, new matters that uh, are raised by the committee. And I think that acknowledgement has got to be made and accepted uh, from the onset. And uh, to indicate that uh, we, and we, and to also reassure the committee that we are, however, uh, hard at work at addressing all the deficiencies in the system. We, we are cognizant of the fact that the challenges we face are quite huge. They by far exceed what uh, have been mentioned by members today. But we take what members have raised today as, as, the, as being part of what is at the apex of our attention in terms of the key issues we need to address and attend to. Chair, I need to also hasten to indicate that, uh, as you may have seen on the presentation of the audit action plan, a matter that uh, previously the committee has decried that uh, we were not implementing many of the key tenets of what is contained in that action plan. Chair would recall that uh, in order for us to finally sit with an audit action plan, we draft it. We, we get our internal audit and all units internally to look at the key findings uh, that have been uh, 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 found by the Auditor General and have, that have been identified as key, having a significant and negative impact on the audit outcomes. We, we, we had then appointed our chief financial officer as the chair of the steering committee, an audit steering committee that looks at uh, tracking and following up all of these key matters and ensuring that uh, the action plans that branches commit themselves to undertake would actually be undertaken and fulfilled. Uh, the committee previously decried the low responsiveness of branches on the number of key commitments made in the audit action plans, a matter that the AG also decried. It's a matter we had uh, had the committee loud and clear, and we began focusing on it right away. And I think that the chair could see from today's report that has been given that uh, almost in the upper 90s of all of the key activities we had committed ourselves to achieve have actually been achieved, and many of them are work in progress that we are confident that uh, for the majority of those remaining, we'll be able to complete them before the financial end or the fourth quarter as we had committed ourselves to. Uh, we believe that when the AG does come to report to the committee, they will attest to some of uh, this key progress we have established. And uh, you would also realize that we had paid uh, key attention uh, to the matters pertaining to the immovable asset register, a matter that has docked our department for in excess of seven years. Uh, and in, in effect, uh, some of the key issues raised by the AG ever since the dawn of democracy and ever since our department started grappling with the immovable asset register. So, so we are addressing that chair. And I think the report itself, when it looked at uh, in that context of what the AG has raised and what we have committed ourselves to, does indicate significant progress in as far as implementation of our commitments in that regard. The AG themselves, when we submitted the uh, audit action plan at the beginning of the financial year, they, they, they looked at it, evaluated it, and they were happy with the interventions we were committing ourselves to. And their comment at the time was that the, the real test would be on whether we are able to implement this, what we are committing ourselves to. And I think today's report will attest to that commitment that uh, implementation of the key issues. There are still some issues that are sticky and that are difficult to resolve right away uh, and which have key dependencies. Uh, for instance, in the immovable asset register, you may have heard about the challenges, which uh, I know Honorable Higlin had raised and also Honorable Graham Mare and Honorable Suisa about the late submission of information for purposes of audit purposes. Uh, this is information we are dependent on our other colleagues in other departments in SAPS on projects uh, that are working in progress, on the DIT office giving us the DIT register on time and all of that. We, we, and you may have heard as the CFO was presenting that indeed we began changing 
our way of doing things and we began putting a greater premium on continuous engagement and on tracking on a quarterly basis instead of waiting until the end of the financial year, the possibility and ability for us to get the documentation on time. And I think uh, that this year, having changed that course, had began and that is why Mr. Sokela could then indicate uh, with clarity that the bulk of the work that typically will be grappling with by this time, by now, uh, we are almost done with it. And uh, in other instances, we have totally completed those tasks. So, so we, we all this augurs well for a good foundation on going forward in, in ensuring that uh, we improve on the audit outcomes and we ensure that there is greater compliance and accountability of what we say, which brings me to the next set of issues that have been raised uh, by the committee members, largely pertaining to the maintenance uh, of our uh, uh, buildings. And, and I have to indicate that where the buildings are under our control and under our, our direct supervision, we, we are uh, doing what we can up to now. We were the first to acknowledge to the committee that the capacity we have was not sufficient, that also the budget we had was insufficient. And also we were now more and more reliant on reactive maintenance and day-to-day -day maintenance instead of uh, planned maintenance. And that in order for us to shift the needle, we're going to have to identify the most frequently utilized buildings that have a direct bearing on service delivery to citizens, first and foremost as category one. And as category two, uh, what is, has been raised today, heritage buildings and related other critical buildings uh, of historic significance and so on. And thirdly, uh, the rest of our other portfolio in this regard. Uh, and as you may be aware, the funding we have, we have indicated from the word go that it will never be sufficient for the entire amount of properties we have. And that key decisions have got to be made about what should be considered excess properties. And which brings me to the issue of the idea of devolution that uh, previous committees of uh, public works have toiled with and have actually even in the past uh, called upon the department to devolve some of these things. And the first of such devolution to occur was in respect of police stations. And some of the police stations so devolved, we were told that there are key critical stations where subs will do a better job than we would do. And uh, as a consequence of it, uh, they were devolved to them with a clear indication and policy of day-to-day -day maintenance in this regard. And we had initially allocated a some amount of 100,000 rand for day-to-day -day maintenance uh, of these police stations and other properties so devolved and where assignment of functions have actually taken place in terms of the provisions of Guiyama. We, we were nevertheless, uh, in, an indication was made that the 100,000 rand was insufficient. And that is why the properties were going into neglect and this uh, and, and disrepair. And we had since uh, decided that we would uh, change that. We increased the allocation to a million rands uh, in, in order to avoid uh, this scenario of where there was insufficient resources and allowed that anything that needed to be done below that threshold, departments uh, where delegations have been given to them were now able to do what they could do. So they could, uh, for instance, uh, replace gizas, repair fencing, and th things like that on a day-to-day -day basis that they require done. And I think the policy itself was good in the context that you would not expect that even if a window pane has been broken, that a department cannot even just call a handyman to fix that. They have to go through public works and we have to go through tender just to get a window pane repaired. So we, with, with that, the policy had sought to address this uh, quagmire. One needs to also ask them to indicate that we are gradually now more and more being blamed uh, for properties we have devolved, either to defense, either to police, and so on. And uh, I think even Honorable Graham Mare had earlier raised a matter of the Harangua police station in a parliamentary question which was responded to on the basis that it was devolved. It had had to take us to go back there to have the matter 
uh, addressed of electricity and to fix it ourselves, having seen that in more than a year it had not been attended to. So perhaps what Honorable uh, Hicklin points out that uh, the matter be reviewed and that uh, uh, we just can't uh, fold our arms and watch as the properties go into uh, derelict. Uh, maybe that's what a, a review in the policy trajectory would have to look at, but I must ask them to indicate that uh, defense is advocating for uh, taking over the entire portfolio. And, and this is a matter that between the two ministers, the former minister Delil and uh, minister Mudise had been uh, twelfth around and had been considered and it was being under discussion. The new minister and deputy minister will need to also apply their mind to that and consider what was on the table in the light of what the committee raises today. Uh, one also needs to attend to the issues that have been raised pertaining to our own capacity constraints and challenges. Yes, indeed, and that is uh, partially linked to the recruitment process. We have at the last meeting briefed the committee about the efforts on recruitment and where we have been, and we have made tremendous strides in this regard. Uh, we, however, have to link the same matter, not just to the idea of recruiting warm bodies, but also to the systems, uh, particularly ICT enablers, and also to look at uh, the quality of the staff one actually recruit and the quality of people and their know-how, their skill sets, and uh, that uh, determine the proper outcomes that we should have. And, and that is a matter we have been paying attention to and uh, we have been trying to improve and we have looked at the shortage in the skill sets we have. And this we wish to give the assurance to uh, members of the committee that uh, it's a matter we are ongoing and continuously looking into it. A, a pointed question was asked uh, about this capacity constraint and exactly what we are uh, articulating. And in this regard, one can only point out to the fact that when the AG comes to audit our immovable asset register, they, they bring four heavily experienced uh, uh, chartered accountants. For the purposes of our own thing and with the levels available within government, we are only able to recruit a candidate chartered accountant. And we only have uh, that one person who, who has got to ensure that the numbers are correct and everything is right, and who has got to put it to the scrutiny of this for heavily and uh, quite uh, experienced uh, uh, chartered accountants. And it's a matter we have looked at and we have said we need to find a mechanism uh, working within the regulations and within the limitations of uh, the current dispensation of the public service in terms of salary levels and notches. And we need to find how we attract these uh, skills and bring them into being to ensure that we, we are at the cutting edge and we are able to do things right the first time. Not only when the uh, experienced chartered accountants point out to where we have got it wrong and where we need to improve uh, so that we can avoid things. Just acting DG we can avoid I think where we have tried to be uh, in terms of the methodologies that are being okay. done uh, to indicate that yes. Hello, Chair. I were losing you, but I think you are fine now. Oh, my apologies, please, Chair. Yeah, please continue. Okay, uh, Chair. We also wish to assure you that we are quite keen on addressing uh, some of the matters that have been raised. And I must highlight that as it relates to the issue pointed out by Honorable Hicklin of the small harbors, our understanding was from the onset was that uh, that sick bay in, at the harbor uh, originally was never intended to be a fully fledged clinic. It was intended to attend to fishermen and uh, uh, sailors who come from sea and who may arrive being seasick and who may arrive uh, uh, injured or any other way, and that they are able of immediate at the harbor to be attended to. When, when the extension of services was then extended to communities, one must ask them to indicate that uh, we were not consulted, that's the first part. The second part, there is no, no existing MOU with us uh, in respect of that. Th th this is making 
the sanctity of the safety of what must happen at a harbor. Quite a risky business if you simply, without any control measures, you, you simply allow members of the public to go even to the side of the quay and uh, the pier without necessarily any significant measures being put in place. Everywhere else where facilities of this nature, including of the state where they have to go through an access control and where even in other instances they've got to pay, uh, everywhere else around the country that, that has been observed as such and has not been uh, seen as uh, an affront to the rights of the public and and uh, presenting the sector departments as being uncaring. So, so I, I would think that perhaps a proper conversation around this matter needs to be held and we have to look at the plans around uh, how accessibility of this is and even better, the possibility of locating a new clinic altogether for the community outside of the sensitive areas of the harbor, which are left for operators as well as fishermen. So I think that that is a matter that we can, on a positive uh, uh, attitude, take uh, forward the conversation and see how it gets attended to uh, in its totality and finality. Honorable Chair, I will ask my other colleagues to answer to other questions uh, that have been posed in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, Honourable DM, Honourable DM is, is back, Honourable Members, uh, and, and you would like to speak, um, you would like to speak now after acting DG. Honourable DM, over to you. Thank you, Honourable Chair, and um, my apologies, uh, Honourable Members. Um, I lost connection. Um, I'm requesting Chair to speak now and not after all the officials because um, I would like to apologize that I'm attending a meeting at 11.45 a.m. But Chair, initially when I got cut off, I was just saying that Chair, uh, the Honorable Members, Graham, Hetland, Suisa, Marcelle, Fanskau, Vake, Matebula, who have all alluded and commented at the state of the properties and how our properties are run, including yourself, Chair is a um, rightful comment because as public works, we are the custodian of properties of the state. And as long as we do what we are doing, we are going to have this with every term of parliament because what should happen at public works at all costs is that as long as we have a paper trail on our properties, we are going nowhere fair things should change. We should have a digitized system of how we account for our properties. We should be able to go onto a system. It must be able to say corner uh, Fasahi and corner this street, Sarah Bartman, there is a property. This is the value. There should be a value certificate. You must get into the system under a property. You must be able to find a deed certificate. You must be able to find out when last the property was maintained. So Chair, I hear the cry of this committee. And there is no way we can do oversight, Chair. We get a disqualified, we then get a disclaimer. But what we are working on is improvements, yes. But when it comes to properties, this committee must understand that um, we are new, yes, but we are not new to the happenings of government. Myself, I come from Scopa, so I know very much about the challenges and troubles of public works based on where I'm coming from. But what I'm saying is that everybody in this committee is commenting on the state of our properties, is commenting on how our properties are being looked after and run. Now, the department cannot keep on telling the committee about policies, about good English on paper, about good systems, but a system that is not there because we should reach a stage where we can press on a button and we are able to monitor which are our properties, where are they situated. The comments from yourself, Chair, from Honorable Romashele and Matebula that, and all other members who are afraid that we have um, private owners of our own properties. 
it is because we are running things in reverse. The state is supposed to be generating income out of its own properties. Rather than having our own properties being run by somebody else, and then we are trying to generate money from that, which means that we are lacking there in terms of how we are supposed to be generating income. And Chair, for me, um, just a comment. Public works is supposed to be run as a PMU because public works is the custodian of our bulk out role of infrastructure. So if we run public works like a normal department, we are going to end up with no time frames because in construction and anywhere where you have development of infrastructure being rolled out, you are supposed to have a start date and an end date. So if we do not have time frames on what we are doing, then it means that we are just a normal department. Whereas we are the custodians, we are the landlords of the whole government itself. So with us being the, the landlord of the whole government itself and all the properties, including harbors, the 13 small harbors at public works needs us to have a manner where, do we have the skills at public works? Do we have a MOU with Department of Transport through their maritime? Because when you talk 13 harbors, it is not about only the people who have leases with us who are docking at the harbors, but we must be talking that what does it give to us as public works in relation to the ocean economy? And also we should reach a stage as the public works a, a committee. Um, not that the public works committee should be special than any other PC, but public works committee cannot do oversight through papers. We should be on site. When we say that uh, our um, uh, maintenance percentage is very low, the committee should do oversight on site itself, actually. When the department says that we've got a backlog on what is happening on our project, projects physically on site, because yes, we have a disclaimer before it was even worse, but now if we are remedying this APP, we should remedy this APP with implementable remedies because we are in the construction space. We are not in any other space and we are in the property space. Now, even if the DG is saying that they are trying to uh, um, balance what we call a gap in the terms, even uh, Honorable uh, 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 Skalvik raised this in terms of uh, the skills that we have. Um, there's a gap. Now, if we keep on saying, Chair, that we are going to recruit people who have the skill, if that is the case, it means that our performance should improve. Because then it means that at Public Works, we have got proper project managers who understand the inception of a project up until its completion, based on a time frame. And if we are saying that we are late, we are late, late uh, chair is English. Uh, I do not want to elaborate more on that. I think on that, we do need to have a PC committee that really explains to the committee in relation to its oversight. Why is it that concurrently with each and every financial year would have people saying that a region, a department, a region this submitted late? Because then it talked to our planning. Where do we lack in our planning? Because chair, I think as a department, when it comes to the APP, we should not come before you as this PC and sugarcoat. Because if we sugarcoat, we're going to go around the same cycle each and every financial year, and we'll find ourselves not achieving the deliverables, which you, on your oversight, has been, I will suppose, on the comments you have given today, advising the department what they should do to try and achieve what is supposed to be achieved in relation to the APP. Because we cannot have an APP for the nice to have that each department must have an APP and for the nice to have that each department must have 
a budget. But we should really speak to issues that are implementable and what is expected from us. Um, on the clinic, I was going to also uh, comment, Chair, that indeed, if a Department of Health or a province decides to make a sick bay and uh, convert it into wanting to assist the community and convert it into a clinic without having a service level agreement or MOU with public works, uh, it has got a lot of implications, Chair, because when the fishermen walk into the harbor, obviously, like any institution, there might be a clock card, there might be a digitized a, a card on how they access the harbor. So now it must not look as if there is some insensitiveness towards the community when a Department of Health decides on its own without having a legal agreement with public works to convert a a, 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 a sick bay into a clinic, then uh, um, we are going to have a, a problems, Chair. But I would also suppose a, a suggest, Chair, that really on the 13 small harbors that would have a separate report a, a, and a PC that talks to this so that we get to the bottom of issues. Uh, thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair and Honorable members of the committee for affording me an opportunity to uh, 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 give my input. Chair, I was also going to comment on the EPWP, uh, the turnaround times, and also the numbers that we produce in terms of uh, being part of the vehicle that uh, creates employment in the system of departments and government. But I think, Chair, because ourselves were also new, we have not yet got a bigger brief and a bigger picture around um, how they allocate, for example, per project and its budget. If a project is 1 million, what is the ratio in terms of us creating employment and what the programs are that actually derives the numbers in terms of the de deliverables, in terms of what the department would have planned in terms of how many jobs it's going to create. So once we have got that, uh, the minister and myself, I think that we've been in a space to uh, comment much better. Thank you, honorable chair and honorable members of the committee. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, GM, for your input and, and the responses uh, to what were raised by honorable members. But I, okay, I think that uh, we're still uh, expecting some um, responses from some of the members of, of your team on, on the uh, questions uh, that have been raised. I understand that also the DG tried to respond to some, but I think there are there are there are comments that are directed to some of the individuals or in which some of those that are part of the management of the department can expatiate further on them. So who is coming now? CJ. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Deputy Minister. Good morning, members. And um, good morning, um, colleagues and DG. Um, in terms of the expanded public works program, uh, particularly on the area of non-compliance in terms of public body visits. Um, um, I just want to be able to state that, uh, yes, it is correct, as the report says, 147 public body visits as at uh, February. That has increased to 177 public bodies. Um, there is a specific uh, standard operating procedures that clarifies how this is done. The reason why we do these public body visits is to say that we are coordinators. And if public bodies are reporting the projects that they have funded through their allocations, 
it is right as the department, as the coordinator to go and check and double check that what is reported is indeed correct because that is what the Auditor General will do. So when we go on a site, we actually check, first of all, our, we take our system, we take the number of participants reported, and we then go to these public bodies and say, we need to see your projects. So then we give them findings or non-compliance issuance to say that we see you have a project, you deem it to be EPWP, but we haven't seen that you've reported it. We tell them that, look here, we've looked through your contracts with your employees, you haven't signed some of them. Some of the contracts were not in place. Uh, we see that some of the participants may not have been reported. Those are the types of things that come up. So for any particular public body, you can visit a number of projects. You visit them more than once until the issue is resolved. And so the business process basically says that we then go and interview uh, the officials, we observe, we inspect uh, the files, et cetera. We develop a report. This report has to go to the officials then of these public bodies with the idea that we then say to them, you must correct this. It is your project, correct it. What then happens is that we develop then what we call an intervention register and we then send it to public bodies and say, look, here, this is our official record. You're required to assign a responsible person that is noted and this is the due date. When we get to the point of there's nothing we can do at an official level anymore. When the officials are non-responsive, that's when we escalate it. And that's why we then have those eight escalation letters. That means the, there's just, uh, it's almost like a limitation of scope. We just don't get anything uh, that has happened. So in terms of compliance, we then have, as at now, 97 public bodies that are compliant. But keeping in mind that this is an active list, projects come on, 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 onto the pipeline, et cetera, projects continue, more laborers are found, et cetera. So um, we then find that, that that is the number of compliant. In those, in terms of those that are non-compliant, we are still then dealing with 72 organizations to ensure that they then either clean up that particular list. Um, Honorable Graham, the issue of um, compliance is a big issue because we've engaged with the DPME and with the Auditor General, and they are very clear with us in relation to uh, the revised framework for SPs and APPs. And they clarify that our role from a coordination perspective, and specifically our coordination role is to be able to coordinate and consider uh, the implementation plan, okay, and to monitor the progress. We working with the Auditor General, and this is where for me the importance compliance aspect comes in. We've changed the MTSF on the advice of the Auditor General, and we changed it uh, then last financial year in October. What that then meant is that now when the Auditor General reviews the MTSF and the APPs, that we are then asking of the Auditor General to ensure compliance with uh, DPME policy, which is to ensure that the EPWP is in then the APPs of all public bodies, which means more than 350 public bodies. And through that process, accountability will come through the EPWP because accounting officers will have to then take accountability for the projects that they then report on. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, CJ. Uh, there was another hand, uh, Mr. Samuel followed by Mr. Stoller. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning to the Deputy Minister and other Honorable Members. Um, I don't want to paraphrase, paraphrase what the DM has already reported on and the uh, Acting Director General. Suffice to say that there are some serious issues that have been raised by the Portfolio Committee. And as indicated, a lot of these issues have been coming on for many, many years. So it doesn't really help to be defensive and to say that you know we have over 130,000 buildings and our maintenance backlog is over three or four billion rand. That doesn't help. I think what the portfolio committee expects 
to see is that there is progress rather than a decline. And um, the portfolio committee expects that what we have committed on in terms of our strategic plan and our portfolio, um, our, our annual performance uh, plan, that we show progress. I don't think it's necessarily the case where there is an expectation that we would have made an improvement on every single building in the portfolio. But at least in terms of the custodial asset management plans and the user asset management plans and that, that, that has been approved, that there is progress. What currently happens, unfortunately, and um, I don't think it would be incorrect for me, uh, DM and uh, Acting Director General, for me to state before the committee, because it, after all it is our committee, that there are so serious issues when it comes to planning. And it's unacceptable that we should take two to five years to plan a project. Uh, hence the question, regarding the union buildings from the Honorable Member. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Honorable Member Nicholson that made the issue about the union buildings being in such a poor state of, uh, um, of repair. What we need to do, we need to, in this coming year, or at least for, for the remaining year, we need to demonstrate to the well, to ourselves, first of all, and also to the portfolio committee, that we can do things differently, but better, and that there should be progress. And our methods of executing projects, whilst we still want to comply with the PFMA and the supply chain management framework, there should be, be different and better ways to do this. We discussed this at our recent hotla, where the traditional ways of executing projects using the design and documentation that takes like forever for us to do it and then getting a contract on board only three years after the time. And then having that contractor using the current model failing because of failures on our side, but also failures on their side. We need to do that differently. And there's certain things that in terms of us making progress, we need to do different things differently in terms of executing projects through our own resources, through our workshop, making sure that we have the capacity at the grassroots levels, right on the ground. Uh, we tend to focus more on issues that are related to non-core business rather than to focus on core business. In addition to what members have mentioned about the 13 proclaimed harbors, issues regarding um, the water, treatment works and the waste water treatment works. There are many opportunities in this, in this department where we can actually make a difference. And, and what we should be doing at the next committee meeting or as the, the deputy minister has suggested, we should have a specific portfolio committee meeting where we, where we share the plans, the concrete plans with time frames, with a baseline program on what we're going to do and what we're going to do in terms of executing it and then report regularly on, pro on progress. I understand the issues that was raised by um, Honorable Member Graham Mare regarding the castle in Cape Town, regarding the houses in Weinberg, uh, the Brighton Beach SAPS. These are all issues that need to be addressed, but we need to have a specific plan and our model of service delivery need to be changed. We have discussed this, as I said, with the Deputy Minister, sorry, with the um, Acting Director General at our region, Jokotla. We need to now discuss it with the, our new Honorable Minister and our new Honorable Deputy Minister. And then we need to take things forward. There are issues regarding the, um, although it's not really in my um, environment, but I'm very much aware of it, the illegal occupation of, of, of buildings. We've discovered this. I have myself visited some of these properties that have been taken over by drug laws and by gangsters, and where we had to get the police involved to get them out in eviction orders. We have now taken some of those properties back. We've renovated it. We've made it available to Department of Social Development for their GBB program. Our, our responsibility, as you know, would be to renovate them for use by these departments. There are issues regarding day-to-day um, uh, -day maintenance that Honorable Graymar has also mentioned. We, we, we can't afford to sit back and listen to this year after year, meeting after meeting. We need to make so that we make progress. Um, a lot of the issues raised by the members uh, are repeated, 
So I'm not going to go into any great detail other than to say that uh, we need to, to prove to the committee and to our, our minister and deputy minister uh, that, that we are able to do things differently and that we will make progress starting from immediate. Thank you, Chairperson, if um, I could leave it there. Thank you. And sorry, I, I was meant to say that I was representing Mr. Lombard, who asked me just to sit in. He's attending a meeting with the OCJ uh, um, regarding the very same issues on maintenance. Thank you. So he's a for you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Samuel, Mr. Sitole. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I want just to make few comments, then I'll allow Boniso to also respond to one of the uh, questions, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, I think I need to raise this issue around the funding for maintenance of our properties. Um, we, we have situations where some of the departments are only paying four rand per square meter for properties that they are occupying, whereby we can't even pay rates and taxes. And the expectation is very high from clients for us to maintain, and yet the amount that they are paying cannot even cover operational cost. I'll make an example of uh, correctional services. Uh, we used to have a, a, a budget of 1.2 for correctional services. It has been reduced to 661 million. So it, that amount can't even cover the day-to-day -day maintenance on uh, correctional services facilities. The total shortfall for uh, the maintenance of these properties, it's about 12 billion, but we are engaging a national treasure on that because it, it's a concern that we are having as the department to say, we are expected to keep these properties and at a, a conducive uh, uh, condition, and yet the funding is not aligned um, to that. Uh, Chair, I will allow Dan Sponiso to comment on the other issues that uh, were raised by the members. Yes, uh, Chairperson, uh, DM, ATG, and honorable members. Uh, the honorable members have raised a concern about state properties that end up in private hands. Yes, as I indicated earlier, that when there's change of ownership, we ring fence these properties for operation breakdown. Our investigations have actually revealed that these transactions were actually fraudulent. And we have uh, been engaging SIU and other institutions uh, to recover these properties. I can inform the committee and the chairperson that last year in September, we were able to successfully recover three land parcels that were stolen by a syndicate. The value, total value, market value of these three land parcels is 144 million. We have a court order that was granted by Justice Ledoaba to say that the department is now authorized to take custody and control of those properties. So even if it's fraudulent transaction, in other words, these disposals were not pro uh, approved by our minister, but we do conduct investigation and engage uh, SIU. But like I said earlier, prevention is better than cure. We've engaged the, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development to implement certain controls to prevent uh, the change of ownership at the deeds office because they, they present documents that would look legitimate to the registers of deeds. And then they will process uh, those transactions. And then we will discover later that actually, this is actually fraud. But we do take steps as a department to recover the properties of the state. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, Chair, I just wanted to address the issue of the month-to-month -month leases uh, to report, Chair, that um, it is an issue that um, uh, we're working on as the Real Estate Management Branch. Since we have started this project, we were standing at 1,700 month-to-month -month leases 
out of 2,400 leases. But now, as we speak today, we have only 129 month-to-month -month leases out of 2,100 leases. But it's a project that we're working on on a daily basis <clears throat> to reduce the numbers. On the next financial year, we're expecting another 520 odd leases to expire. So what we're doing now, we're engaging with the clients as of now to say to, for them to give us mandates so that we can start negotiating those leases before they even expire. One of the biggest problems that we have, and I'll give an example of SAPS. SAPS is our probably the biggest client that we have with almost half the leases that we have belong to SAPS. Now, if we keep on getting smaller mandates, like a year there, two year there, three year there, we are then kept on a procurement mode. And when we start procuring these ones next year, the other ones are expiring. We start procuring those ones the next year, the other ones are expiring. So now we're trying to change the strategy to say to, to our clients, to say, want to give us longer term uh, mandates that will then align us uh, to be able to renew leases and have a breather in between before we start renewing. Otherwise, we are forever on a procurement mode. It is a discussion that has started and uh, we're thinking we are making um, strides in that, in, in that regard because now we're starting to see more longer term leases. And with longer term leases, we get to even bargain for more maintenance power from the landlords and upgrades for, 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 for the clients because we find that sometimes a client will give us a three-year mandate or a two-year mandate based on the fact that the landlord is not maintaining the building. And then we say, if we don't get a longer term mandate, it's difficult for us to even negotiate for even uh, greater upgrades by the landlord. So it's a bit of a catch-22 situation that we're working on, uh, Chairperson. There's a few issues there and there that we are still dealing with. There are cases that uh, have got SIU investigations on them where we cannot renew the leases, but we need to find alternative accommodation for those clients. And we have cases where we have got deceased uh, as, uh, landlords where the, uh, their estate executors are still busy with those estates, so there's not much we can do. And then many of these other categories are with our state-owned entities where our minister or our former minister was busy in uh, intervening with uh, the various ministers and MECs, and we were getting um, a good response. So it's a, it's a project that we're working on, and we'll be very happy to, to give them a breakdown of, of where we are right now with month-to-month -month leases. And also along with that project, um, uh, Chairperson, we have now realized a, a saving of 800, more than 800 million since we have started. And this is because every time we renew leases, leases that are on month-to-month -month are usually at their most expensive rate at the time. So if it stays at a month-to-month -month rate, it is very high and it is untenable. So when we renegotiate the leases, we bring them down to market and we use Roger, Roger report, which then reduces um, almost immediately, comes back to, to, to market rates, rentals. And so far we're at 823 million since the project started. Thank you, Chairperson. I think I just needed to, to give a perspective on the month to month leases. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nieleti. Um... Honourable members, those are the responses on, on the questions and comments that have been raised uh, in, this, in this meeting. Um, I think Acting DG, uh, in his uh, um, opening or preparing for others to respond, I think he partly covered all as much as the the, the management after him has touched on some of the issues. I can see that uh, Honorable Siwisa would, would like to make a, a follow-up, just a, a, a reminder, Honorable members, uh, those that are, are in the park, just like some of us, the buses leave at 12 and, and, and again uh, at 12 here in Akashia Park, uh, it will be low shedding. So we'll have serious challenges. Uh, I think including where uh, Ms. Martinez is, there will be load shedding. Um, Honorable Sylvester, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I won't hold you up. Uh, Chair, in the response of the acting DG, he spoke about commitment. 
We don't need only commitment whereby we are told that even the AG is going to tell the commitment that DPWI has into rectifying their mistakes, but we actually need to have consequence management to be put in place where the need arises and, and it should be considered. Monitoring and evaluation should be a priority and holding people accountable if the need arises. And again, Chair, maybe let me rephrase my question. What is the sense of leasing buildings and then renting out buildings that belong to DPWI? You've got buildings that you are willing to rent out. And in the same breath, you are willing to go and lease buildings for, for, for sister departments. It doesn't make sense to me. And I've been asking this question for so long and I still, um, I don't know if it was ever responded to or it's either the response that is there is not satisfactory because really it doesn't make sense to me that there are buildings that can be utilized and be given to sister departments. But in the same breath, those buildings are going to be rented out to private owners and then go back to private owners to rent buildings for sister departments. So my question is, what is the sense in, you have buildings that you can utilize for sister departments, but you are willing to give it to private, to rent it out to private ownership and then go back to the same private ownership and rent buildings for sister departments. It doesn't make sense. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Honorable Senator. Uh, though I would like it to be a, um, a dialogue, but can you come in acting, DJ? Acting, DJ? Mr. Sitole, you said that in the absence of acting DG, you are the one acting. Mr. Sitole? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Uh, it was at that time, but Chair, just to respond <laughs> to... <laughs> uh, just to respond to the uh, comment that has been made, uh, Chair, there are properties that uh, are a surplus properties where then we let them out to, to, to private and anybody from the public, which we call then rental debtors as part of revenue generation. There are also certain program like the ROT where we invite the private sector uh, to repair a particular property then that will then sign a, a, a contract with that specific uh, investor, where then that investor will upgrade the property. It's, it, it's a matter of the, the funding model, where as government, we don't have enough money to upgrade properties. Instead of relying to private sector for leases, we take our stock that need to be upgraded we then invite the investors to put money to upgrade a particular property. Then we sign a contract whereby a, a, a user department then will pay a particular fee, maybe two for 10 years just to recover uh, the investment that may have been put in a property. It's not necessarily that um, they will sell the property to a private sector and then that private sector is letting back to government. So it's a model that we are exploring. We'll start with the five properties that we indicated, but uh, Sisnye Lady can explain it better than I can, but that's the answer that one can provide. Thank you, Chair. Acting DG. Acting DG is still uh, having challenges. Um, what, what, what I can say, um, is that can we then get a, a written response on this on this particular question that uh, the Honorable Suisa has constantly asked, but uh, sometimes you the department will duck and dive when it comes to a proper pointed response on this one. So let me appeal 
um, uh, on that one, that can we get a, a return a response on this? Uh, the Office of the Acting DG, uh, can, it, can it really assist in informing um, a DG? Uh, honorable members, as, as you know that uh, with the APPs that um, the minister has not yet signed off and presented to speaker, we can't continue with item number two, as I indicated earlier on. But I really would like to appreciate the way that the honorable members have uh, deliberated and, and debated on this uh, meeting. Um, and usually the way that they usually do, we really appreciate the progressive uh, deliberations on this meeting. It's still, uh, uh, let, um, let me say, uh, the minister and the DM, they are new. They may not be new in parliament, but they are new in the department. So we may have some hiccups there and then, but we expect the best uh, from them. We really appreciate what the DM has said, but uh, I know that she has to leave the meeting at quarter to 12. But, um, the DM must understand that uh, as this portfolio committee, we've always been hands-on. When we speak of properties that are not occupied, when we speak of properties that are being vandalized, we speak of something that we have seen, we speak of something that we have been there. I think Honorable Prime Mare indicated clearly that uh, on the issue of those um, the barracks in, um, in, in KZN, she has been there. When I speak of the houses, residence, accommodation in Kumbu, I've been there. When we speak of telecom towers, we've been there. So, so one thing that we're good at as this portfolio committee, as much as it is limited to go to oversight, but at our own time, constant time, we go to oversight. Uh, we go and visit the public works property. It doesn't mean that we will say this week we're going to oversight, but we do that at our own time. And we are great on that, especially on the issue of properties that we must go to our respective uh, constituencies. And even if we are, it's not your constituency, but when you know that it's a public property, we need to go there and check what is happening there. So that when we discuss in the meeting, we discuss about something that we know. So that's something that, that, that we have done, but we also appreciate the, the the, 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 um, the interest uh, of, of the TM on the issue of the small harbors. It's something that we have also deliberated on several times that the 13 small harbors that we talk about, the majority are in Western Cape. You have an Eastern Cape that has kilometers and kilometers of, of the sea, but you don't find any a small harbor there. There is Bots and Johns, and we have talked about this several times. We hope that uh, DM and the minister will follow this and we'll see it progress on this one. Again, um, thank you so much, um, honorable members, uh, DM and minister, acting DG and, and your team for a successful meeting today. Hoping to see you on, on Wednesday next week. Honorable members, the meeting that we're planning to have tomorrow uh, in the evening, uh, it, won't, uh, it won't happen. We will be having a meeting on, on Wednesday next week at our usual time, that is our meeting will be on the 22nd. Thank you again and thank you to, to our team, our support team, which is always uh, supporting us and on point in all the things that it has to do. Um, the meeting is urgent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Have a good day, everybody. Recording stopped. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good afternoon.